All right, well, <laughs> thank you guys for coming and for waiting during our <laughs> judge break. Um, so most of you are probably familiar with the animals that I work with. You've seen them cross your dinner plates. Scallops, mussels, uh, clams, commonly known as bivalves, are the species that I study. Uh, so besides being delicious, they're part of a really big um, industry here in Long Island. You guys are probably familiar with aquaculture, that's the farming of these animals, and that industry here is so big, it actually yields seven million dollars a year, sorry, 11 million dollars a year to the state industry, to the state budget. Um, besides being delicious, these guys are also really good at uh, providing other services, including cleaning the environment. That's because when they eat, they actually filter out particles that are found in the water, so they make the water cleaner. And that service, they're so good at it, and that service is so big that they save us here in Long Island about $300 million a year in nutritional, um, nitrogen waste removal. So that's only including the aquaculture, the farm populations. If you include the wild populations, that number doubles. So because they provide so many services to us, a lot of people are interested in the life history and how to maintain healthy populations. Now, bivalves have a strategy that we like to call spray and pray. This is how they reproduce. So the video here that's showing is their strategy. They basically just release the eggs and the sperm, which you can see here, and hopefully that egg and those sperms find each other and the egg becomes fertilized, producing that beautiful little larva you see on the side. And that larva has that giant structure, right? It looks like little wings that have the little hairs. Those are cilia, and that helps it swim around, but it also helps it to collect food. So that's how it collects food in the wild, brings it to its mouth, and it can survive as it swims around trying to find a place to live. Eventually, they metamorphose into that adult that we all know and love. Now, this is kind of like a caterpillar becoming a butterfly, that uh, metamorphosis, except instead of flying around, the adults are kind of stuck where they are. So, not the same. Very, actually very different. <laughs> um, and this transition period to from larva that's free swimming around to uh, an adult that's stuck is the uh, period that I'm interested in. Now, as I mentioned, uh, these larvae are called villagers because of that velum structure that they have, and that structure is with them for a couple of weeks. It's nice and big, and throughout time, then they shed it. And that literally means that they just plump it out, and then they crawl around the bottom. And then at this time, they have a foot, which you can see kind of sticking out, or they have this wonky, useless little gill that uh, we believe does nothing. And the reason for that is because in the adult, you can see the gill there is kind of like not fully formed at all and see-through. In the adult, the gill, you guys know the gill, just like the fish, helps them breathe, but it also helps them collect particles. So we know exactly how that helps in the adult, and we know how they eat as uh, larva. But in that transition period, we have no idea how they're meeting the nutritional needs. Is there another structure that's helping them do that? Or do they just have enough of a reserve from when they're swimming around to make it through that time? And that time can take months. So it's a really long time to go without eating. So those are the kinds of questions that I'm interested in. Now we know the questions, how do we figure out the answer? Well, marine ecologists like me have to get creative. Uh, most of you are probably aware of a Tupperware party. This is my kind of Tupperware party. So, because these guys are so good and just release their eggs and sperm, it's really easy for me to just separate moms and dads, put all their stuff together, and just get as many babies as I need for my experiments. And because they produce so many babies, again, that's another thing they're really good at, I can move on to what I call hipster science. Um, I can use solo cups, I can use mason jars, basically any clean container I can get my hands on, and I can just have all these little animals in there, a lot of them just because they're so, so tiny. And then I can go on and give them different types of food. I can give them stuff that's floating around, I can give them stuff that's stuck in the bottom, and I can manipulate what they're eating and how much of it they're getting. And then throughout this time, I can then look at things like grow. Are they getting bigger? Are they getting nice and fat? Um, in this case, fat is good. The fatter they are, the better off they will be when they become adults that can't move. Um, I also use high resolution imagery called scanning electron microscopy to see those little hairs form, right? Because we know that cilia helps them collect particles. So if we find those hairs in that structure, we have a pretty good indication that that's how they're getting their food during this transition period. So now, 
I don't have a lot of answers yet. This is ongoing research. So um, one of the trends that I have found is, unfortunately, that one of the foods that the industry uses, one of the artificial foods that they give these guys, is actually not good for them at this stage. And in this experiment, has actually resulted in pretty high mortality, which is not good news. Uh, the research is ongoing, and I'm hoping to share more of this stuff so that we can help these animals. They provide so many services for us. I'm hoping that now we can answer some about this time, and now we can do the same for them. Thank you for your time.